We are now live. Good afternoon and welcome back to Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Uh, we are taking a little time out from our deliberation on our initial redistricting bill to uh, take a peek at the town meeting uh, emergency response bill. Um, this bill will look very similar to what um, to what the committee passed into law during the first week of session last year. Um, so we have invited Tucker Anderson to help us understand the uh, version of the bill that the Senate has up on the floor, I think uh, momentarily, I think they're calling themselves into session right now at one o'clock. And then I would love to go through and hear from some of the other folks um, about uh, your responses to the bill. So Tucker, take it away. Good afternoon, Tucker Anderson from the Office of Legislative Council. Good to see you all for the 2022 session. Uh, you have in front of you S-172 as introduced and an amendment that was voted out of the Senate Government Operations Committee yesterday. It should be version two of the amendment and I believe it is posted for you all to view. Uh, I'll start with a brief overview walk through of the bill, and then I'll describe what the amendment is changing within the bill as introduced, because I do not know as of yet whether the bill has been amended on the Senate floor. Uh, so to start, uh, there are essentially two operative provisions in the bill here. The first uh, is a piece of temporary authority that you passed in the first week of the session last year that would allow municipalities to adopt the Australian ballot method of voting for the 2022 annual meetings. These would be typically floor vote municipalities that do not have permanent Australian ballot uh, voting in their municipality. This would allow them to shift for this year's meeting. And then the second provision uh, is the option for those municipalities to move the date of their 2022 annual meeting to a date later in the year. Section one of the bill contains the legislative uh, findings, intent, and purpose. Uh, these are very similar to the findings, intent, and purposes that you considered in last year's bill. Uh, starting in subsection A, the findings describe that because of the continued spread of COVID-19 in the state of Vermont, there's the potential that the health and safety of Vermonters who are voting at their annual meetings uh, could be jeopardized. Um, it describes the types of meetings that this would cover. That's your annual town meetings, but also your school district meetings. Moving on in page two, subdivision two, describes that in 2021, so last year, you all passed Act 60 to authorize the use of outdoor polling places and the mailing of ballots to all active registered voters steps taken to give some of this permanent authority to municipalities. However, concerns still persist because there are municipalities that wanna preserve their custom of floor voting and those municipalities need temporary authority if they want to convert to Australian ballot voting for this year. The intent and purpose section in subsection B describes it is the intent of the General Assembly that the citizens of Vermont be able to protect their health, safety, and welfare while continuing to exercise their right to participate in their annual meetings. And therefore, the purpose of the act is to permit, first, by vote of the municipal legislative body, uh, municipalities can apply the Australian ballot system to the municipality's 2022 annual meeting. And second, the opportunity to move the date of the municipality's 2022 annual meeting to a, to a potentially safer date later in the year. Moving on from section one into section two, which contains the operative provisions. This is the temporary authority that is being granted to the municipalities. Subsection A deals with temporary authority to adopt Australian ballot voting. It uh, states, notwithstanding the provisions of 17 VSA section 2680, subsection A, and 16 VSA section 711E, and to uh, clarify, 17 VSA 2680A covers Australian ballot voting for municipalities, 16 VSA 711E 
covers uh, Australian ballot voting for school districts uh, that require the voters of a municipality to vote to apply the provisions of the Australian ballot system to the annual or special meeting of the municipality. In the year 2022, any municipality may apply the Australian ballot system to its annual meeting by vote of its legislative body. Any vote shall also apply the Australian ballot method of voting to any vote that occurs as a result of the annual meeting, such as budget revotes or reconsideration votes. Essentially what that subsection is saying, municipalities by the vote of their legislative body, select board, city council, et cetera, can apply the Australian ballot system of voting and that will carry through to any linked votes that may happen later, such as budget revotes or reconsideration. Subsection uh, B deals with informational hearings that precede the annual meeting, and it allows municipalities to hold those informational hearings using electronic means. Would you like me to pause for questions or go through the walkthrough and questions at the end? Let's pause for a moment and Representative Anthony go right ahead. Thank you, Tucker. Thank you, Madam Chair. In the notwithstanding uh, paragraph just above, shouldn't uh, charters be included in that string of VSAs? Uh, yes, if there were charters that specifically required anything having to do with Australian ballot. At the time that we drafted this last year, there were no charter provisions that we found that called for specific voting provisions related to Australian ballot. So the general law controlled. Okay, so the dates would not be an issue because there is obviously permission to move the dates. We will get to the dates later and you will oh. note specifically that we do set aside charters in that section. Thank you very much, you're ahead of me. Appreciate it. Representative LeClaire. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good afternoon, Tucker. Um, I'm looking on page two, section two. I just want to understand what I'm reading where it refers to um, action resolves of number 60. Does that mean that everything that was authorized then would be authorized again going forward here? In other words, like the outdoor polling places and the mailing of ballots to all active registered voters and municipalities? So the understate is giving the municipalities, the legislative body, the authorization to have mail out voting as well. Yes, and that act specifically amended 17 BSA section 2680 to say that in the municipalities that use Australian ballot voting, they're permitted to uh, by vote of their legislative body. And I think coordinated through the municipal clerk, they can just mail out ballots to all active registered voters. As opposed to people being asked um, using um, absentee voter ballot requests. Right, rather than having yeah. the voters submit a request. Very good, thank you. And just to clarify, this is again permissive that the legislative body could choose to do a universal mailed ballot, but they don't have to. So some municipalities might choose not to and require people to request a ballot. Since I did not work on Act 60, uh, I would have to either go back and check to see whether it's still, uh, I believe it is permissive, but I know that Will who worked on that is also with us. If I could punt that question for later. Sure. All right. To steer us back into the corral of the bill. Subsection B, we just started touching on it. This deals with those informational hearings preceding the meeting. Subsection B permits municipalities to use electronic means without designating a physical location to conduct those public informational hearings that are held to set held pursuant to 17 VSA section 2680 sub H. Uh, when those meetings are held electronically under the authority that is granted in this bill, the municipality is required to use technology that permits the attendance 
of the public through electronic or other means. So the public has to be able to attend. Second, to allow the public to access the hearing by telephone whenever feasible. Third, to post information on how the public may access meetings electronically and to include that information in the published agenda for the hearing. In subdivision three that follows, there's an additional requirement. Unless unusual circumstances make it impossible for them to do so, the legislative body of each municipality and each school board shall record any public informational hearing held pursuant to this section. Um, you may have some sense of deja vu. That is because all of these requirements were applied to the temporary open meeting law provisions that you all passed during the state of emergency. So these are being borrowed from that language and applied to the electronic hearings that municipalities can hold uh, prior to the annual meeting. Moving on to subsection C, and Representative Anthony, I'll point you to this opening clause. Notwithstanding any provision of law to the contrary, which would include those municipal charters that have specific dates, in the year 2022, a municipal legislative body may vote to move the date of the municipality's 2022 annual meeting to a date later in the year, 2022, and second, that the town of Brattleboro may hold its annual representative town meeting by electronic means. Both of these provisions were included in last year's bill. And to bring you back, the reason that the town of Brattleboro is called out is because it is the sole municipality in Vermont that uses the representative annual town meeting model. And all of those people who will be voting as representatives at the annual meeting are known and can be identified and therefore can vote remotely. Subsection D, this provides that in any municipality that decides to move the date of their 2022 annual meeting, the municipal officers of that municipality shall serve until the annual meeting is held and uh, until successors are chosen. Subsection E, this is temporary authority for the Secretary of State to ensure that these provisions uh, are active. So the Secretary of State may waive statutory deadlines or other statutory provisions or provisions set forth in a school district's articles of agreement related to municipal elections as necessary in order for a municipality to apply the Australian ballot system to its meeting in accordance with subsection A of this section the waiver applies to statutory provisions that are set forth in a municipal charter or provisions set forth in a school district articles of agreement if the waiver is requested by the municipality. The act is set to take effect passage. Moving on to the amendment that has been proposed by the Senate Committee on Government Operations. And it, there are two instances of amendment here the first is cleanup of uh, my sloppy work in the initial draft of the bill where I included uh, mention of uh, voters being required to request their absentee ballots. Well, Act 60 took care of that. You don't need to request your Australian ballot anymore. So that was erroneously included. The first instance of amendment wipes out that reference in the underlying bill and condenses um, the findings in the findings section. The second instance of amendment is substantive and comes as a result of uh, some communities using the prior year's uh, authority, temporary authority, to put items, uh, worn items on the ballot um, that would permanently convert the municipality to the Australian ballot system. General law does not allow a municipality to use Australian ballot voting to ask the question, should we use Australian ballot from here on out? That is not permitted by general law. Under a strict analysis of last year's bill, 
It was not allowed last year either. But the Senate Committee on Government Operations is proposing here to add a set subsection F to state very expressly, general law still applies, you are not allowed to do this. Subsection F states that the provisions of 17 VSA section 2680 sub E, that's the subsection that says you can't use Australian ballot to permanently convert to Australian ballot. That subsection shall apply to any municipality that votes to hold the 2022 annual municipal meeting by Australian ballot. And it goes on to state expressly a bit of uh, belt and suspenders here. A municipality shall not warn any question on whether the municipality shall adopt the Australian ballot method of voting on a permanent basis for any or all articles for any subsequent municipal elections. And that's the Senate amendment. Thank you. I appreciate that. Representative Vihovsky. Yes, thank you. I asked this question yesterday, but my community was one that I do believe did that. They uh, put the Australian ballot question on an Australian ballot and sent it out in 2020, I believe. Do they now retroactively need to change that, given that they weren't supposed to do it in the first place? I do not think that is a question that is appropriate for me to answer because I do not want to counsel your municipality on what they may have to do under the previous year's law. Fair enough. Any other questions for Tucker about the bill or its amendment? And just since this is moving rather quickly and we are gonna to try to make a, a quick turnaround on this, when it comes over to us, uh, it will be all in one bill. This, this amendment that you've just gone over with us is, uh, is going to be added on the floor. And when the Senate sends it over to us, it'll, so we, we, don't, we won't need to necessarily make a distinction about, um, about whether it, this was part of the bill or an amendment, except to the extent that we want our fellow House members to understand that most of this is something we saw last year. Representative Higley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I think Tucker mentioned it as well. Um, the only other time that we may have to look back at this again is if they make additional uh, amendments on the floor, correct? If the Senate working on it now makes any additional um, changes, then, then we would want to look at that again, correct? Okay. Correct. Yes. And luckily we have all day Thursday to do that in the event that they do. But um, I'm hoping that we have been in regular enough contact with them that we would we would know if we were expecting them to do something else. Um, of course, they are, they are on the floor as we speak. So um, thank you so much, Tucker, for walking us through that. Um, I think I'd like to go first to um, Carol Dawes to hear the perspective of the municipal clerks. It is important to all of us that we make sure that our clerks feel comfortable with, uh, with legislation that we move through the house. So welcome, Carol, and happy new year. Thank you, Madam Chair, and same to everybody else. Uh, for the record, Carol Dawes, I'm the Barry City Clerk and Treasurer and the Chair of the Legislative Committee of the Vermont Municipal Clerk and Treasurer's Association. Um, and uh, I watched the testimony yesterday um, and the, the vote uh, by Senate GovOps um, have read through the bill. Um, we support the bill. We support the speed with which uh, both bodies are, are taking this up. We really do appreciate that. Um, we have uh, deadlines that are fast approaching um, and municipalities will need to make uh, decisions very quickly. And, uh, and so the the rapidity is is definitely appreciated. Um, the only section of the bill that I've had some conversations with uh, uh, Will Senning in the Secretary of State's office is the final section, which talks about 
the Secretary of State's office um, having the authority to um, make some uh, waiver provisions um, on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, that makes perfect sense to, to us. Um, last year, you may recall that uh, there was a blanket waiver um, associated with uh, petitioning um, and consent of candidate forms. Um, that certainly made more sense under the emergency order. Uh, we're not thankfully in that position anymore. Uh, those of us who are running for uh, Australian ballot voted offices know that, know we need to do petitions. Uh, the only time it comes into play is if a community chooses to move from a floor vote to Australian ballot and wants to stick with the March 1st date, that really narrows the window for getting uh, petitions um, handled. Uh, and in those instances, communities being able to um, talk with the Secretary of State's office about uh, a waiver uh, makes perfect sense. And I think that that's the, the intent of that section of the language. So we're, we're very supportive of the, the entire bill. And again, thank you. Excellent, thank you for being here. Uh, Representative LeClaire. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, Carol. Um, did your group take a formal vote on this or are you just reflecting conversations with a few members of your organization? We didn't take a formal vote on it. The, the um, exact language of the bill has only been available for a very short period of time, but it has been uh, um, an item of conversation going back as far as our September annual meeting. Um, we talked about it at length about the different options that would that would be coming down the pike. Um, there certainly has been a, a lot of discussion uh, via email over the last couple days since the draft was available. Um, and I would say that the vast majority of the, the clerks that I have heard from or talked to um, are supportive of this. Um, most questions now are just clarifying questions. Um, and the, the, uh, the question about um, waivers for petitions, uh, depending on whether a community moves to Australian ballot, has, has been the one that we have uh, been addressing the most over the past 24 hours, um, but uh, but clerks uh, are are understanding what the what the process is is looking like now. Very good, thank you. Yep. Any other questions from committee members for Carol Dawes? All right. Next up, we have the dynamic duo of Gwen Zakoff and Karen Horn from VLCT. I'm not sure which one or both of you were planning to share your uh, thoughts with us. Go right ahead, Karen. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and Happy New Year to everybody. Hopefully, we'll be meeting in person fairly soon. Um, we are very supportive of S172. Um, and as Carol said, the speed at which you're getting it passed. We've had a number of questions from local officials really since the early fall about how are we going to be able to conduct town meeting in 2022. We had a webinar yesterday while the um, Senate GovOps committee was debating the bill and um, we had close to 70 participants on that webinar and, and I would say the vast majority of the questions were um, related to this legislation. So uh, that that's essentially our testimony. I will mention that Will Senning was also um, on that webinar yesterday, provided the bulk of the information around um, town meeting. So um, thank you for taking it up. The one thing that I do need to mention is that there's at least one town that has contacted me about the amendment, that would be Heinsberg. And in Heinsberg, they did have a vote via Australian ballot to move to Australian ballot on a permanent basis. And the manager there said, or the administrator, excuse me, said that they had um, far more people voting on Australian ballot than they generally do in a floor meeting. But I just pass that along to you. 
Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from committee members from the VLCT perspective? All right. And last but not least, we have the dynamic trio from the Secretary of State's office. Um, Secretary Condos, do you want to kick it off and uh, share with us the work that you've done to uh, inform this bill? Certainly. And thank you, uh, Representative Copeland Hansis, uh, and welcome, committee, uh, again. Um, we have worked with VLCT and many of the clerks, including Carol. Uh, on these issues, uh, as Carol decided, said, starting back in the fall, uh, we started having those discussions uh, and, and we fur had further discussions with uh, House and Senate leadership uh, leading up to uh, this move. We actually asked the governor at one point whether he'd be willing to add that to uh, the, the special session that you guys had since it was we felt it was related but he said he would prefer that we, the legislature deal with it at, at, at the first uh, week or so of, of the session um, we are thankful and we are we're surprised that the senate moved as quickly as they did yesterday and literally at the end of the day passed it out of committee to the floor uh, that was good news um, in general, we we fully support this bill um, and 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 the amendment uh, because we think it's the right thing to do at this time. Um, I do want to raise one issue, which I'm not going to push for, uh, but on page four of the amendment, at the very top, it's where it says allow the public to access the tele the hearing by telephone, where whenever feasible. I can't imagine a scenario where it would not be feasible if they're going to an electronic format. Uh, so it, it, I'm not sure that those two words were, were necessary, but uh, I'm not, I'm really at this point, we want this bill put into place as quickly as possible and we're willing to go with it as it is. So we support it. I don't know if Chris, you wanna add anything or Will, it's up to you guys. <clears throat> I don't have anything to add. Thank you, though, uh, Secretary Condos. Thank you, Committee. Um, Will Senning, of course, can respond to any of the detailed questions that you might have for implementation of this on the ground and his many conversations that he's had with clerks about this already. Thank you very much. Will, do you have any, uh, any responses to any of the previous questions that we've covered? Sure, I can have a a quick response and give you a very quick spiel because I know everybody's time is limited. First, I want to say hi to everybody. Great to be back and see all of you. A um, little more gray hair after a few years of COVID in my beard than I had before, but um, <clears throat> wish we didn't have to be here talking about this again, but we are. And to that point, so really quickly first, on the, the one question that was raised, it's very clearly just permissible for these municipalities to opt to mail a ballot to all registered voters or not. That's a clear may as it was written in Act 60. <laughs> and that gives me the chance to just quickly say that I think um, the content of this bill, how minimal it is and how kind of targeted it is, is a testament to the work you guys did on Act 60. Because as Tucker mentioned, this is in large part modeled after Act 1 of last year when we were faced with a similar situation, right? One of the, what we did is we looked at Act 1 and the directives that our office issued as a result of Act 1 under the, the more broad authority that you gave us to issue directives in that Act. We kind of looked at the provisions in both of those places and chose the one or two that we felt were um, the most effective the most highly utilized by towns and municipalities across the state. And those are the moving of the date of the meeting and the ability for the legislative body to move to Australian ballot, the two main operative provisions that you see in this bill. Um, one of the main operative provisions that was left out was that brought more broad authority for the secretary, for secretary condos to just um, implement election procedures to um, conduct elections more safely during the pandemic. We didn't feel that broad authority was necessary at this point. Um, that's a pretty extreme step, extreme step, right? To, to grant the Secretary of State that authority to just kind of come up with procedures. 
it was very much necessary and very much appreciated last year by us um, and all the clerks and local election officials. But we didn't think it was necessary this time. And a big reason for that is because you all took the step to make permanent a lot of those options in X60. So for example, the outdoor polling places, the drive-through polling places, the ability for towns to um, decide on a permissive basis to mail ballots to all voters, um, the early processing of ballots, a lot of what worked so well in those directives that you allowed us to make um, last year has now been made permanent in Act 60, and so we don't have to include it here. Um, so I think the bill is crafted just as it should be, um, putting in place, the, again, the most effective provisions from last year, knowing that we have everything that's in Act 60 currently in permanent law in our pocket, too, as options for those towns. And just want to be really clear about that waiver authority in Section E that Tucker mentioned. And again, that that is not the broad authority for the Secretary of State to come up with procedures. If you read that language carefully, it's, it's really that we can grant waivers that are particularly targeted at letting a municipality adopt the Australian ballot system. And the, the instances of that that occurred last year were, for example, when the legislative body couldn't meet until week or so after the, the bill had come out and they're right up against some of the deadlines the big one being that candidate petition filing deadline which is january 28th and so if if some of these municipalities get around to making the decision to switch to australian ballot at such a late date that they're bumping up against the candidate filing deadline and or a couple weeks after that the the ballot printing deadline which is 20 days before the election they could email my office and ask us, explain the circumstances and say, could we bump one of those deadlines back a couple of days, et cetera. Um, and so as Carol mentioned, we'll be happy to field those requests for waivers for municipalities that are taking advantage of that provision to have the legislative body decide to use Australian ballot for this one annual meeting election. Um, and we'll assess the need for, for moving deadlines for those particular municipalities. And I think that's it, happy to answer any questions. So uh, last thing, I'm looking at my notes. Keep in mind that with a lot of the more um, sort of specific circumstances and situations in some of these different kinds of municipalities across the state, that I think the ability to move the date of the meeting operates as sort of a catch-all to get certain municipalities out of sticky wickets that are coming up on March 1st. So just remember when you're hearing concerns about whether even what we're doing here is enough. The big one that is the that is the easy the easy way to solve a lot of the issues at once is just to say delay the meeting for a couple months. And I know that has its own problems for communities um, looking to get everything in place for this upcoming year. But um, I think that's an important point to remember. Thank you very much, Will. Um, Representative Leclerc. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Will I. I'm glad you commented about the beard because I was going to say you're coming close to catching up with the Dep deputy secretary of state as far as that coloring goes. A um, couple of questions I have is how many municipalities does this apply to? And I recognize you may not have the exact number off here off the top of your head, but as far as those that would normally meet in person and could possibly go to Australian ballot for one and two, do you recall how many municipalities took advantage of that last year? So I can't give you that right off the top of my head, Rep. LeClaire, but I could get back to you for sure because there's, and there's actually data on our website. Um, we did a lot of work last year to collect data from the towns after the annual meetings about who made the switches. Um, in general, it's a pretty even split between our hand count towns. And um, I mean, our floor, floor count towns, I should say, our floor meeting towns and the Australian ballot towns um, I recently read an article in VT Digger where I believe Kevin had looked at that data on our website that I'm referring to, and I think he narrowed it down to only four or five towns that actually held in-person floor meetings um, okay. on the first Tuesday in March last year. So okay. very many took advantage of it. Good. Okay. Thank you, Will. Yep. All right. Any other questions from committee members for any of the witnesses? Excellent. 
Well, thank you all for being with us on short notice. Um, oh, Representative Lefebvre. Sorry, I had one quick question. So last year we were able to assist our towns um, for those that usually have the four votes but switched to Australian ballot and mailed out their ballots with some funding. Are we going to have any availability for that this year? Because I know that was a no. So no assistance, no assistance at all for anything. Um, Not to pay the costs associated with performing those mailings. No, and and. We did not pay for that postage last year either, Rep Lefebvre. That's not um, the federal money that we often use to support these activities can't be used for local elections that don't include a federal candidate on the ballot. We did, as you remember, we provided a lot of PPE, for instance, um, and other means of support using our um, emergency federal funds, coronavirus funds. Those aren't, uh, those aren't still operative right now. So, um, we revert back to the standard statute, which says that the municipality bears the cost of local elections. And I think just, just to take that further, uh, Rep Lefebvre, the, um, that would take a legislative action. If you remember, the legislature actually uh, ponied up a, a significant, along with the governor, ponied up a significant amount of money to our, our agency to handle those reimbursements and that was ARPA money and we don't have any of that. That money was, is all gone. Uh, we used it and then gave the rest of it back to uh, uh, the government, to state government. Um, and uh, so there is no money available. And I, I, I just wanna quickly follow up to Rep Lefebvre so that it's not the impressionism that we're hands, hands up and you're on your own. Um, just before this meeting, I was on the phone with the printing company that is going to be printing all of the envelopes for these local elections. And so while we're not able to pay for them, I have done um, a vast amount of work coordinating those orders, uh, making sure that the towns get their quantities that they need in on time. And um, just slight offshoot, you all should know that uh, paper sourcing is a huge issue right now. Um, and just getting the appropriate amount of envelopes into the hands of the towns in the next two months is going to be a big challenge. Never a dull moment. Uh, any final questions from committee members? All right. Any of our witnesses think of anything else they wanted to share with us about the bill as we expect it to leave the Senate. I would just say, uh, Madam Chair, that I, I thank the committee for taking this up quickly uh, and look forward to, once you receive it, moving it as fast as you can so we can get it to the governor's desk. Thank you very much. That is our intention as well. Um, so committee just uh, for, for timing purposes, we will make sure that we take a, a check-in on this bill tomorrow after it has left um, the Senate, because it is my hope that we can be teed up and ready to, um, to approve the bill as soon as it gets referred to us from the House floor on Friday morning. All right. Uh, if there are no other questions, I think that completes our committee work for this afternoon, and we all have a joint assembly to go to in a different virtual Zoom room. All right, great work today. Thank you, folks, for being with us, and uh, we'll see you.